Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Just take a few moments to let folks join the webinar from the waiting room. All right. Um, hello again. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon um, for the main DEP briefing on the most recent greenhouse gas emissions inventory. Uh, my name is Molly Siegel. I'm the Maine Climate Council Coordinator at the Governor's Office of Policy, Innovation, and the Future. Um, and I am pleased to introduce Stacey Knapp, who's going to be providing this briefing um, on the latest greenhouse gas emissions inventory. Um, so thanks so much, Stacey, for joining us this afternoon. Stacey has to run to a conference right after this presentation, so we really have an hour um, to get through all of this really important information. Uh, we may take some questions at the end using the Q&A feature of this webinar if we have time, uh, but really I want to turn it over to Stacy to provide um, the briefing and she will um, share how you can get in touch and ask additional questions afterward. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Stacy. Um, thanks so much for being here this afternoon. Excellent. Thanks, Molly. All right, let me share my screen. All right, can everyone see that okay? That looks great. Excellent. Okay. Well, good afternoon, everyone. As Molly said, I am Stacy Knapp, and I head up the emissions inventory section here in the Air Bureau at Maine DEP. And we are here today because I have the results of the most recent greenhouse gas inventory to share with you. Now, these data have just been completed, so I know none of you have had time to review and digest this information. So today I'm going to walk you through the results, and I'm very happy to answer any immediate questions you might have. And just know that I'm also here to answer any questions you might have after taking some time to read the report as well. Really, I love this stuff, so please don't be shy. Okay, let's dive in. If you can remember back during the summer of 2022, I shared the data from the ninth biennial report with you. We had met our 2020 goal and Maine's gross greenhouse gas emissions were 25% below 1990 levels. Now, we're all anxious to see how we've done since then, and I'm excited to report our gross emissions have continued to decline, and Maine's gross greenhouse gas emissions are now 30% below 1990 levels. That's definitely something to celebrate. Now, we are going to break this down a lot, but here's the figure most of you are here to see. So let me explain what you're looking at here. This figure shows a time series of gross greenhouse gas emissions. Gross greenhouse gas emissions are the sum of all anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions released to the atmosphere by all sources within the state every year, regardless of how much carbon is sequestered in the environment. So emissions up only, no sequestration. Now, looking at the figure along the bottom on the horizontal axis, that's our reporting time frame. So 1990 to 2021. And the vertical axis is the amount of emissions in units of million metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalents. Now that green line at the top, that's the total or gross greenhouse gas emissions. That is the line we use to assess our progress toward meeting our goals. Now the blue line below represents CO2 emissions from the combustion of fossil fuels. The other lines in this figure are our reduction goals, those gray dash lines. So 10% below 1990 levels by 2020, 45% below 1990 levels by 2030, and 80% below 1990 levels by 2050. Okay, let's go back to our green line, the gross greenhouse gas emissions. Now, as we reported in the ninth report, we did meet our 2020 goal with emissions being 10% below 1990 levels. And let's walk these emissions from the beginning of the reporting period. So you can see we were at 31.4 in 1990. Emissions rose from there, peaking in 2002 at 37.1, and we've seen a decline since 2002, primarily due to a decrease in the use of high carbon fossil fuels. Now by 2012, emissions were below 1990 levels, but they rebounded slightly between 2013 and 2015. Now thankfully, gross greenhouse gas emissions have been trending downward again through the end of 2021. So to meet our 2020 goal, we needed gross greenhouse gas emissions to be 28 or lower. That's 10% lower than those 1990 levels. And we were at 21.3, so we did it. Now, obviously 2020 was a strange year. Emissions were lower than expected due to a decrease in activity of all kinds related to the pandemic. And you can see that signal here in the data, that dip in emissions between 2019 and 2021. Now, the important part is that while our emissions did rebound after the pandemic, 
they were still lower than that 2019 level. So 6% lower to be specific. So as of 2021, as I mentioned, we see a 30% reduction in gross greenhouse gas emissions from those 1990 levels. Now next, let's take a look at that blue line, the CO2 from the combustion of fossil fuels. In 2021, emissions of CO2 from burning fossil fuels accounts for 65% of Maine's gross greenhouse gas emissions. You can see that pandemic signal in these data as well with that dip in emissions in 2020. Now, unfortunately, unlike the gross greenhouse gas emissions, which declined in 2021 compared to 2019, CO2 emissions from the combustion of fossil fuels were the same in 2021 as they were in 2019. So that's something that we, we need to do something about. Okay. Now that you've essentially seen the finale first, let's back up and we'll start breaking this down and looking at the details. Now first, let me explain our analysis and where we get these data. I'd like to direct you to the department rule, chapter 167, which outlines the methods used to track and report on both gross and net greenhouse gas emissions. This is the best source for the, the how. Right? Chapter 167 was updated in February of this year and will continue to be regularly updated as methods and data sets evolve. Now, as you can see, for the development of a gross greenhouse gas inventory, we use EPA's state inventory tool, fondly referred to as the SIT. Now, this tool is publicly available if anyone wants to download it and check it out. I've provided the EPA website for you here. Now, the foundational data set used in this tool is from the US Energy Information Administration. So EIA collects loads of information about fuel used by states across the country, and they combine those data along with other details from federal and state agencies into a model of consumption data. Now that's by state, and it's called the SEDS, or the State Energy Data System. Now this data set includes consumption of all types of energy, including fossil fuels and renewable energy sources. Now the SIT pulls in that energy consumption data along with a number of other data sets and models the data, filling in those gaps to estimate greenhouse gas emissions by state. So this is the starting point. But here in Maine, we make it better. We have data from Maine that the federal agencies don't have, and we are able to make those changes in the SIT where we know our data is better so that the results best represent actual Maine emissions. Now, we want to ensure that the results for Maine are as accurate as possible, so we enter in and add data such as vehicle miles traveled, solid waste landfilled, and biogenic emissions, just as examples. Now, this is the second greenhouse gas report to include a net inventory. Both the first and the second net inventories were major undertakings by Maine scientists. And you can read more about the methods in chapter 167, but for simplification, I'll just say that the general method is to quantify carbon emitted and subtract that from carbon sequestered. Now, this is done for a number of different categories, as we'll see later, and compiled into a full carbon budget showing the flow of carbon. Now, before we jump into the results, I do want to clarify some units and terms that have prompted questions in the past. As you'll see throughout this presentation and the greenhouse gas report, there are two primary units we use to report greenhouse gas emissions, million metric tons of carbon dioxide and million metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalents. Now, million metric tons of carbon dioxide is just carbon dioxide, while million metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalents includes more greenhouse gases converted to carbon dioxide equivalents using their global warming potential. Now, all of these definitions are listed in chapter 167, but for those less familiar with the lingo, global warming potential is a measure of the heat absorbing ability of a particular greenhouse gas relative to CO2. It's more complicated, of course, including decay rates, et cetera, but that's the general idea, right? How much more does a gas contribute to warming compared to CO2? Now, using that conversion factor, that global warming potential, we can calculate carbon dioxide equivalents and be comparing apples to apples. So you'll see both million metric tons of CO2 and million metric tons of CO2 equivalents as we go through these data. You'll also notice references to both source categories and energy sectors. Now, source categories are categories of activities generating greenhouse gases, and they include energy, agriculture, waste, and industrial processes. Now, all greenhouse gases can be allocated to one of these four source categories. The energy source category is then further broken down into economic sectors that consume energy 
I know the term energy sector can be used in many different ways, so I wanted to make sure I defined how we use this clearly. So when we talk about greenhouse gases, we use energy sectors to isolate emissions for the five energy consuming sectors. That's transportation, residential, commercial, industrial, and electric power sectors. While some may not think of electric power sector as an energy consuming sector, in this case, this electric power sector consumes energy to generate the electricity that we use. So it includes emissions from facilities that produce electricity through processes like the combustion of an energy source, such as the combustion of fossil fuels. Now, I know it can be confusing, don't get me wrong, um, and it, it gets worse. <laughs> the industrial processes source category, for example, is not the same as the industrial energy sector. So the industrial processes source category represents emissions from industrial processes that do not involve the production of energy. So emissions from processes like refrigeration and fire extinguishing, while the industrial energy sector describes emissions from burning fuels to generate energy within an industrial setting. So like burning fuel oil or natural gas in a boiler or an engine. So hopefully that clears up some of the confusion there. Now, I don't expect you to be able to see this, so don't need to squint. I really just wanna direct you to this resource in the appendix of the report, should you be interested. So this table breaks down emissions by both source category and energy sector and shows how they can be properly added up. So it's a useful resource. Okay, let's get back to the data. All right, here are gross emissions by source category for 2021. Now, one of these pieces is a lot bigger than the others, right? Energy. Our consumption and demand for energy is responsible for most of Maine's greenhouse gas emissions. That's 94% specifically, so almost all of it. Agricultural activity, industrial processes, and waste disposal combined only contributed 6% to the total in 2021. Now, this 6% is still important, and we have strategies to reduce these emissions, but energy certainly gets the most attention, and this is why. Now we can break down this big blue energy piece of the pie over time and look at the different energy sources we depend on here in Maine. So we're looking at emissions here, but we're going to jump to energy consumption to break down these energy emissions. So you can see here how our reliance on each energy source has changed over time. And you can see that our total consumption has decreased over time. In fact, in 2021, our total energy consumption was 29% less than in 1990. Now remember that emissions of CO2 from burning fossil fuels account for 65% of Maine's 2021 gross greenhouse gas emissions. That was that first figure we looked at in the presentation. Well, fossil fuels include coal, petroleum products, and natural gas. And you can see all three of these here. Petroleum is that big blue segment at the bottom. Natural gas is the red segment in the middle. And coal is that navy blue line toward the top that you can really only separate in the early years. So there are a few things I wanna point out here. First, let's look at natural gas. Again, that's that red segment in this figure. There was a 1,152% increase in natural gas consumption between 1990 and 2021. So while natural gas was only 1% of the energy consumption matrix in 1990, it's 17% in 2021. Also notable is that the consumption of natural gas increased by 24% between just 2019 and 2021. So you can see how the red section is getting wider in 2021, while wood, the green segment, and hydropower, that smaller blue segment, got smaller. Now, also of note are the renewable energy segments. We just talked about wood and hydropower, but also take a look at wind, solar, and biofuels. That's the peach, yellow, and orange segments here. You can see these energy sources, are they're not even visible in 1990, right? You can't see them at all. But they're claiming some space in 2021. Consumption of solar power, for example, has increased by 206% in the last couple of years between 2019 and 2021. Now, the most obvious, that big blue piece in this figure is petroleum. So in 2021, petroleum products accounted for 49% of all the energy consumed. That's 51% of gross greenhouse gas emissions and 78% of CO2 emissions from the combustion of fossil fuels. So let's break this piece down a bit further because it's important. Just this blue segment down at the bottom. So this figure shows our consumption of different petroleum-based fuels over the reporting period. You can see the biggies here, right? Motor gasoline in blue at the bottom and distillate fuel above that in red. I also wanna point out that orange segment toward the top. That's residual fuel oil. 
And the reduction in the use of this fuel is 97% since 1990. That's a large driver of the overall decline in Maine's gross greenhouse gas emissions. So some of this can be explained by the increase in natural gas use, particularly in the industrial, electric power, and commercial sectors. Now, there's more good news here. Overall, petroleum consumption in Maine has declined by 34% between 1990 and 2021. Linked to that, CO2 emissions from burning petroleum-based fuels have also decreased by 36%. All right, so next we can break down petroleum consumption by energy sector. So we're still looking at energy consumption here, but this time we're looking at the breakdown by sectors that consume energy. Now, all sectors have reduced consumption of petroleum since 1990, but some more than others. So the transportation sector has been the leading consumer of petroleum for all years. But the sector has decreased its petroleum consumption by 15% from 1990 to 2021. Now, the 2020 pandemic signal is really strong in this time series. See that dip there in 2020? That rebounded to just below 2019 levels in 2021. Now, the residential sector has reduced petroleum consumption by only 13%, while the commercial, industrial, and electric power sectors have achieved significant reductions. So commercial at 35%, industrial at 69%, and electric power at 97%. Now, even though the residential sector hasn't seen the largest decline since 1990, there's a very promising slope in the residential line from 2018 through 2021. That's an 8% decrease in just three years. Now, maybe this is due to an increase in heat pumps for residential heating? Could be. Um, I also want to point out how relatively flat the line is for electric power between 2019 and 2021. So you'll see an increase in emissions in this sector later, and this figure tells us that it's not from petroleum. Okay, sticking with energy sectors, let's switch back from energy consumption to emissions. So this figure shows that the transportation sector produced almost half, that's 49%, of all CO2 emissions generated from the burning of fossil fuels in 2021. The residential sector accounted for the next highest contribution at 19%. So expanding this to look at the full reporting period, we can see that the transportation sector has been the leading contributor of CO2 emissions for all years, but the sector has managed a 12% decrease in CO2 emissions since 1990. Now, again, we see that strong pandemic signal here in the 2020 transportation emissions data. So the industrial electric power and commercial sectors have also all reduced CO2 emissions over the reporting period. Commercial at 22%, electric power at 39%, and industrial at 51%. Now for electric power, if we just look at the period 2002 when emissions peaked to 2021, that sector shows a 79% reduction. I also wanna call your attention to the electric power line between 2019 and 2021. So that's the turquoise line near the bottom there. You can see an increase in CO2 emissions in this sector over the last couple of years. Remember a couple of slides ago how we didn't see an increase in petroleum for this sector? Well, these emissions are primarily due to an increase in the combustion of natural gas in 2021. So it turns out that 2021 was a very dry year. So we saw a 28% decrease in hydropower consumption from 2019 to 2021. And when we substitute combustion of fossil fuels for hydropower, we're gonna see an increase in emissions. All right, now let's look at the residential line. That's that red line. While there's a lot of variability of the reporting period, the residential sector has seen an overall decrease of 11% between 1990 and 2021. And remember that decrease in petroleum consumption we saw in the residential sector between 2018 and 2021? Well, we see that directly translated into a similar decline in emissions for this sector. So these are CO2 emissions from burning fossil fuels. And we know that in 2021, this accounted for 65% of total gross greenhouse gas emissions. Now, this is why emissions from CO2 from fossil fuel combustion are often a primary focus when assessing greenhouse gas emissions. Now that said, Additional greenhouse gases, such as methane and nitrous oxide, are also produced during the fossil fuel combustion process, and combustion of renewable fuels generate biogenic greenhouse gas emissions that must also be considered in a complete gross greenhouse gas inventory. So let's look at all gross greenhouse gas emissions from each energy sector. Now, we're expanding our scope here. In the last slide, we looked at just the CO2 emissions from the combustion of fossil fuels. 
Now we're looking at all greenhouse gas emissions produced through the production of energy, including non-CO2 greenhouse gas emissions and greenhouse gas emissions from combustion of renewable fuels. So you can see the purple line, the industrial sector had the highest emissions early on in the reporting period, but the transportation sector emissions, that's that blue line, have remained higher than industrial since 2012. Now, before we dig deeper, let's point out the win, right? All energy sectors have reduced emissions since 1990. So again, something to celebrate here. So transportation at 9%, industrial at 58%, commercial at 12%, and electric power at a 41% reduction. Now for the transportation, commercial, and electric power sectors, these decreases are linked to a reduced burning of fossil fuels. For the electric power sector, the turquoise line, you can see that uptick from 2019 we were talking about in the last figure. This is mostly due to an increase in natural gas combustion, but wood combustion has also increased in the sector since 2019. Now for the industrial sector, that's the purple line, the reduction since 1990 is due to a decrease in a combination of both high carbon fossil fuels and combustible renewables. So emissions from fossil fuels were 51% lower in 2021 than in 1990 for the industrial sector and combustible renewable fuels were 61% lower. Now, residential sector emissions, that's the red line, have decreased by only 0.4% over the 1990 to 2021 timeframe. However, it's important to note that the population has increased by 11% over the reporting period. The use of fossil fuels and renewable fuels in the residential sector are changing in opposite directions. So CO2 emissions from the combustion of fossil fuels were 11% lower in 2021 compared to 1990, while emissions from combustion of renewable fuels have increased by 26%. Okay, this is a good time to look at the emissions from electricity. We've received a lot of questions about these data in the past, so we added a comparison to the ninth biennial report, it's the last report, and we'll continue to show these data. So let me explain. Our gross greenhouse gas inventory is referred to as a production-based inventory. So that means that we count emissions that are produced in Maine. So if you imagine a giant barrier around the state and only emissions produced inside Maine are seen by the atmosphere, well, in this case, we don't count emissions from electricity produced outside of Maine, even if it's used in Maine. But we do count emissions from electricity produced in Maine if it's exported and used outside of the state. This is the standard method because it's physically what's happening here. And it helps prevent double counting when looking at multiple state greenhouse gas inventories at once. Now for electricity, consumption-based emissions are emissions from the generation of electricity used in Maine. So if the electricity is used in Maine, no matter where it's produced, those emissions are counted. Technically, the atmosphere above Maine might not directly see those emissions, but there's no actual line in the sky. And you could argue we're responsible for them because it's our demand for that electricity that's creating emissions elsewhere. So to be as transparent as possible, and because we know many are interested in these data, we include both data sets to show you the differences. Now, do keep in mind that consumption-based emissions are not yet available with biogenic emissions. So the dark blue line in this figure that's our normal method, right? The production-based method, which does not, which does, excuse me, does include biogenic emissions. So those are the emissions generated in Maine. Now to compare apples to apples, I've removed biogenic emissions from the production-based emissions in the light blue line. So what you wanna compare here is the light blue line, that's the production-based emissions, with the green line or the consumption-based emissions. Now you can see that the consumption-based emissions are a little higher. And that is due in part to the different mix of energy sources used to produce electricity outside of Maine, as well as the fact that we are currently a net importer of electricity. So here you can see imports and exports of electricity. So positive numbers represent imports of electricity to Maine and negative numbers represent exports from Maine. So the green line is international exchange with Canada. The blue line is interstate exchange with other states. And the orange dashed line that's the net total exchange. So that orange dashed line being above zero indicates that we've been a net importer of electricity in recent years. Okay, next let's look at emissions from renewable energy sources. So here we see wood emissions by energy sector. So overall emissions from burning wood account for 26% of gross greenhouse gas emissions. And these emissions have decreased 46% since 1990. 
Now the industrial sector, it's a purple line at the top, has been the lead emitter from burning wood. The electric power sector, or the blue line, has historically been the second largest contributor, but fell below the residential sector in 2017. Now both industrial and electric power sectors have reduced emissions from burning wood. Industrial emissions in 2021 were 61% lower than in 1990, and the electric power sector was 43% lower. Now, while we see a notable decline in wood combustion emissions in the industrial sector since 2018, we can also see a slight uptick in that electric power sector since 2019. Now, the use of wood for energy has increased by 26% in the residential sector, which is the red line here. And in comparison to other sectors, the commercial sector, that green line, relies very little on this renewable fuel for energy. All right, next let's look at ethanol and biodiesel. The transportation sector uses, utilizes, utilizes, there we go, both of these renewable fuel sources to generate energy. Biodiesel is currently limited to the transportation sector, while fuel ethanol is used by the industrial and commercial sectors too, but in much lower amounts. The transportation sector began mixing fuel ethanol with motor gasoline in 2005, and biodiesel by the sector began in 2007. Now, while you can see in this figure that the consumption of both of these renewable fuels has grown, they represent a minor contribution to Maine's gross greenhouse gas emissions. So in 2021, fuel ethanol emissions were 1.8% of gross greenhouse gas emissions and biodiesel was only 0.2%, so just a tiny bit. All right, switching gears again, let's look at the money. So in this figure, time is our horizontal axis as usual, but we now have two vertical axes. At the left, we have main gross domestic product or state GDP, which can be used with the dark blue line. And on the right side, we have gross greenhouse gas emissions in million metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalents. And as you can see, the economy is growing, right? That blue line is going up and up and up. The pandemic signal in 2020 is interesting in this time series as well. Do you see that little clip? Now, the point here is that Maine's GDP continues to grow steadily, while at the same time, at least since the peak in 2002, our gross greenhouse gas emissions are decreasing. Now, when we combine those two lines by dividing gross greenhouse gas emissions by GDP, we see the declining trend in emissions per million dollar of GDP. Now, this 59% decrease from 1990 to 2021 indicates that Maine's economy is transitioning to lower carbon emitting fuels, more efficient equipment, and industries that require less energy per dollar of GDP. Okay, and this wraps up the gross greenhouse gas data I wanted to share with you. And next we're going to pull in sequestration data and see where we are on the path for achieving our carbon neutrality goal. So here it is. This is the second ever Maine carbon budget. Now, two years ago, I presented the first net greenhouse gas inventory for Maine. And since then, a lot of effort has gone into updating these, these data for version two. Now first, let me thank the folks listed at the bottom of this slide from the University of Maine, Bayes College, Maine Forest Service, Gulf of Maine Research Institute, Bigelow Laboratories, Maine Natural Areas Program, and Maine DEP who completed this work. And an extra special shout out to Dan Hayes at the University of Maine for this one. Pulling this carbon budget together was no small feat. Each number you see in this graphic required a lot of effort from a number of people. It's really convenient that it all fits on one slide so you can take it all in, but please don't let that mask how valuable it is. Now, let me walk you through this. So this is how we quantify where we are in terms of carbon neutrality and how far we have to go toward achieving our goal of being carbon neutral by 2045. Now, these data are based on a five-year window ending in 2021. You're looking at the flow of carbon through the system. And as you can see, there are many sources and sinks to consider. Now, the primary buckets we sort carbon into are in boxes along the middle, gross emissions, wood products, forest land, agriculture, urban areas, inland wetlands, inland waters, coastal wetlands, and coastal waters. Now, within each of these buckets, you can see sources and sinks of carbon. Positive numbers represent emissions up into the atmosphere, and negative numbers indicate sinks or sequestered carbon. Now you can see smaller circles at the bottom between the buckets which show flow between these categories. For example, you can see carbon linked to wood harvested from the forest land. Now, while some of that decays or is combusted, some is retained in wood products, reducing the amount of carbon emitted to the atmosphere. 
Now the small circles above show net exchange between these categories and the atmosphere, and the two larger circles in that blue area at the top, those are the totals. So now let's look at the data. Let's start with the green box, which is Maine's forest land. Approximately 89% of Maine's land area is forested, so we have a large capacity to store carbon. This forest land category includes live biomass, dead biomass, and soils, and has an estimated net uptake of 22.2 million metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalents per year. Now, of this net annual uptake, 14.8 are sequestered in the forest land. Now you can see the totals within that green box, those add up to 14.8. In addition to the amount sequestered in the forest, 1.4 million metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalents leaves the forest through aquatic transport and six is harvested. Now, while some carbon from wood harvested in Maine remains stored in wood products, the decay of wood, as well as the combustion of wood for energy, result in a release of greenhouse gases to the atmosphere in the amount of 4.4 million metric tons. Now, agriculture and urban environments are also net emitters of greenhouse gases. You can see this by the positive numbers in the blue circles above those buckets, that negative 0.2 and that 0.9. Now, while processes in inland wetlands, inland waters, and coastal waters result in net emissions, that's that 0 0.7, 0 0.8, and 0.6, coastal wetlands sequester 0 0.07 million metric tons of carbon dioxide. Okay, let's combine all of these pieces. So growth, anth anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions, environmental emissions, outgassing, and uptake of carbon in the environment all together result in a net uptake of 14.7 million metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalents per year, which is 91.3% of the 2021 gross greenhouse gas emissions. So 91.3% of gross greenhouse gas emissions are offset by sequestration in the main environment. And 8.7% of our gross greenhouse gas emissions or 1.4 million metric tons remain in the atmosphere. That's that airborne fraction. Now, when we achieve carbon neutrality, that airborne fraction will be zero or less. This is an incredibly useful snapshot of how carbon th flows in this state and work is already underway to update these data through 2023 for the next biennial report. Now, before you ask, let me answer a likely question. So how did we jump from this 75% reported two years ago to now being 91% of the way toward achieving carbon neutrality? Well, there are a handful of reasons. Part of this is due to the method change. The Forest Inventory and Analysis arm of the US Forest Service, they're known as FIA, well, they changed the way they calculate carbon in the forest. So everyone across the country essentially got a boost in carbon. Now the environment didn't actually cause that change. It was just that the methodology was improved. And yes, it, it is actually a more accurate method. So in addition to that FIA change, Maine researchers also refined the way they estimate environmental emissions and sequestered carbon in Maine. We changed the window from 10 years to five years to both represent more recent years and to more closely align with the FIA data cycle. Now, the first carbon budget was a first pass and a lot of effort has gone into improving those initial estimates to this next version you see here. So if we look at those methodology changes for the previous time period, which was through 2016, we would have actually been at 80% instead of 75%, which is notable, but not a dramatic difference, right? And the rest of the increase in our progress toward achieving carbon neutrality is a result of both decreased gross anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions and increased sequestration. For example, carbon stored in both Maine wood products and in Maine's forest has increased. Now, the details to this are super important. Um, something like a carbon budget is extremely detailed, so stay tuned. Later this summer, the researchers who compiled this second version of the carbon budget will release a report with much more detail, and you can see the data used in this analysis. Now, the link is here on the slide, but just a heads up that it won't be updated with the new carbon budget until later this summer, so you got to wait a little bit longer. Okay, now another frequent question I receive about this work is forest carbon markets. Now, a handful of you were just about to ask. So we all know that participation in carbon markets is growing in Maine, in the nation and internationally, right? It's actually still pretty slow in Maine though, relative to other areas. So this figure shows both the carbon credits issued and the carbon credits retired for all Maine land enrolled in carbon markets since the first credits were issued in 2003. Now, for those not familiar with carbon markets, let me define a couple of terms. 
so credits issued, and credits retired. So carbon credits are issued when they are approved in a carbon market project and available to a project owner to sell. Carbon credits are retired when they are used or when the issued credits are purchased by another entity and used to offset their carbon emissions. Now, when carbon credits are used, they're retired and removed from the market. So what does this mean? Well, as of 2021, there were 24 forest projects in Maine listed with carbon offset credits. Now, if we look at the annual average sum of these credits, of the credits retired for these 24 main forest projects over that five-year window, that five-year window we considered a means net inventory, that's the 2017 to 2021 window, we get 1.2 million metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalents per year. Now, that's not a big number relative to Maine's gross greenhouse gas emissions, but it's not negligible. We're, we're not in the decimal places anymore with carbon offset credits. Okay, so as an example of what this could mean, Let's assume that all of these retired credits were sold out of state. If that's the case, the carbon sequestration values in Maine's carbon budget could be adjusted. So that 14.7 we just learned about in the carbon budget that's sequestered each year by Maine's environment, that number could be reduced by the carbon sold outside of Maine at 1.2 listed here. Now, only if these credits are sold outside of the state would we need to consider an adjustment like this. So, Continuing our example, if we do assume that all main carbon credits sold during this period were sold out of the state, then the total carbon sequestered becomes 13.5 million metric tons. Now that means the 91% of gross greenhouse gas emissions being offset by sequestration in the environment, that becomes 84%, just something to think about. Now, before you ask, let me add, that currently there are not complete data sets on carbon offsets generated in Maine or where carbon credit buyers are located. The carbon offset market in Maine is small, but it is growing and no official state policy exists on the specifics of net carbon exchange calculations. Now, there are several initiatives emerging in the state to continually improve our tracking of greenhouse gases and carbon cycling. So for the time being, we will continue to focus on a net carbon exchange calculation. That's the one you saw in the carbon budget. We're not going to make any assumptions about carbon offsets sold but we will also continue to present both calculations. So with and without those carbon offsets, because we want complete transparency with these data. And we wanna make sure that these data sets are available to guide the ongoing conversations about this topic. Okay, so we've seen the carbon budget and know that in 2021, we were about 91% of the way toward reaching carbon neutrality by 20, 2045. But a time series is really helpful to see where we've been and where we're headed. Again, let me thank researchers at the University of Maine for pulling these data together. And this time, Adam Dagnow gets the shout out. Now, what you see here are historical and projected Maine greenhouse gas emissions. So these are based on gross greenhouse gas emissions as well as forest carbon data. Now, let me stress, these data are not as complete as the carbon budget. Not all of those data are available going back to 1990. So remember that the carbon budget is our official assessment of our net greenhouse gas emissions. Okay, but let me explain what you're looking at here. So the light blue line at the top shows the gross greenhouse gas emissions, including biogenic emissions. So these are the data we looked at earlier this afternoon. The solid line in the data that we is the day we do know from 1990 to 2021. And the dotted light blue line from 2022 through 2050 that's a projection crossing through our 2030 and 2050 gross greenhouse gas reduction goals. So the green line at the bottom of this figure represents total forest sector carbon. This represents forest contributions to carbon uptake in the form of growth, wood products, and wood used for energy. Now these add up to the carbon removed from the atmosphere. Now, if we subtract the total forest sector C line from the gross greenhouse gas emission line, we get the net exchange of greenhouse gases, which is that dark blue line in the middle. That's the net greenhouse gas emission line and needs to be zero by 2045. And as you can see by the dotted projection line, we're currently on track to meeting that goal early. Now, let me add, while I think this projection is very helpful in visualizing where our net greenhouse gas emissions are going, there are some major assumptions. So first, we assume a continuous glide path of gross greenhouse gas emissions 
we assume it passes through our 2030 and 2050 goals. So we assume we will achieve a 45% reduction in gross greenhouse gas emissions by 2030 and an 80% reduction by 2050. We also assume that the relatively high rate of forest carbon sequestration in the recent past compared to historical standards will be maintained indefinitely. Now, this does not accommodate for potential increases or decreases in future forest carbon sequestration rates in Maine due to management, new incentives, forest disturbance, or natural forest successional processes. Now, there are additional caveats, of course, but you, you get the idea, right? It's a projection. It's not as robust as the carbon budget, but it's an idea of where we're headed. Now, all that said, it won't become reality unless we work for it. So we need to achieve those gross greenhouse gas reduction goals set for 2030 and 2050. Okay, let's recap a little bit here and run through some of the major highlights. Now, forgive me for reading these to you, but I thought it would be useful to summarize them all on one slide. So gross greenhouse gas emissions in 2021 were 30% below 1990 levels. Maine is approximately 91% of the way toward carbon neutrality, which means that 91% of gross greenhouse gas emissions are offset by sequestration in the environment. CO2 emissions from fossil fuel combustion in the electric power sector have decreased by 79% since they peaked in 2002, largely by replacing high carbon fuels with low carbon energy sources, primarily natural gas and renewable sources. Now, gross greenhouse gas emissions per million dollars of state GDP were 59% lower than 1990. In other words, Maine's economy has grown while greenhouse gas emissions have declined. 94% of gross greenhouse gas emissions are the result of energy consumption. 65% of gross greenhouse gas emissions are CO2 from the combustion of fossil fuels. 49% of CO2 emissions from the combustion of fossil fuels are from the transportation sector. And the transportation and residential sectors have both the highest consumption of petroleum and the highest emissions of CO2 from burning fossil fuels. So much of this is great news to be celebrated, but clearly we have some work to do if we wanna reach our goals. Now, I think taking a look at some more recent trends can help with planning and strategy. So let me summarize those two. Here are some observations over just the last two years between 2019 and 2021. Now, I will be the first to admit that there are way too many variables at play over a short couple of years to make any definitive conclusions from these observations, but I find them interesting nonetheless. I think you might too. So we saw a 6% reduction in overall gross greenhouse gas emissions. Unfortunately, we saw no reduction in the CO2 emissions from the combustion of fossil fuels. We did see that dip in 2020, but it popped right back up to those 2019 levels. Focusing on the energy sector emissions, there was a 57% increase, not decrease, in the electric power sector. We talked about this a bit earlier about hydropower having a bad year and the sector having to, whoops, oh, hold on a second. Where was I? Oh yeah, okay. Um, sorry about that, I clicked my mouse accidentally. So we talked about hydropower having a bad year, right? And that sector having to supplement with more natural gas and wood to produce electricity. Well, there was a slight decrease of 3% in the commercial sector energy emissions and essentially no change in the emissions from the transportation sector. Now we did see success in the residential and industrial sectors. Emissions in the residential sector were reduced by 13% and the industrial sector emissions went down 25%. Now, as we know, our consumption of energy was responsible for 94% of our gross greenhouse gas emissions. So understanding that energy consumption is important. Now, between 2019 and 2021, we saw a 24% increase in natural gas consumption, primarily in the electric power sector to, to balance that 28% decrease in hydropower. We also saw a 19% decrease in wood consumption. Our petroleum consumption stayed relatively stable with only a 2% decrease. And finally, solar power saw massive growth with a 206% increase since 2019. So again, in some areas we've had fantastic progress to celebrate, but there are clearly areas where we really need to focus if we're going to reach our greenhouse gas reduction goals. So let's take one more look. Now we can go to the next slide. Here are the gross greenhouse gas emissions along with our future reduction goals. So that green line at the top there, that's the data we know. Those are the gross greenhouse gas emissions from 1990 to 2021. That dotted line is the 1990 baseline in which we base our reduction goals. And the three dark blue dots represent our greenhouse gas reduction goals. 
So you can see we have successfully achieved our 2020 goal, which is hugely encouraging. Now, based on the slope of the line in recent years, we are on track to meet our future goals in 2030 and 2050. But that requires we continue to realize the emissions reductions we've achieved in the last few years. And that's going to take some work. So I'm going to end there and happily take any questions that you might have. I will leave you with my contact information. So if you do have any questions after you review that report, definitely feel free to reach out. Great, thank you so much, Stacey. Um, there are some questions coming in through the Q&A box, so I, I'm not sure if you have a specific order that you'd like to tackle those in. Um, can I see the Q&A box? I can see the Q&A box. Okay, yeah, um, I'm going to just start at the top, if that's okay. Does that work? Do I need to say who the question is from, or can I just read the question? Um, you don't need to say who it's from, but once okay. it's answered, it will show up and people will be able to see who the person is. Okay, excellent. So um, there's a question about what data are being used to measure residential wood consumption and where did it come from? Um, so we do a survey. We hire a third party to do that survey so that it's not biased. Um, and they do both a phone and an email survey and reach out to Maine homeowners to make sure that they get a statistically robust sample size. Um, we follow the lead on many other states who do this as well because the EIA data, the Ener Energy Information Administration data, the wood data for residential, we know is not perfect for Maine, right? Because frankly, people have wood lots in the back of their house and they can go out and cut that wood and they don't report it to the federal government. Um, and so that is the one energy source that is not very well tracked through that said state base. Um, but we, as I said, we complete a survey, reach out to homeowners. We have a third party to that. So that's that question. Um, is there a possibility we are underestimating our blue carbon sequestration? Um, that is a question for the blue carbon team. I am not going to guess at that. I can tell you that we have some of the very best marine researchers in the state working on this. Um, and as I mentioned, there is a link on the carbon budget slide um, that sends you to a University of Maine webpage. And blue carbon is a piece of that carbon budget. And when that when those data and the associated narrative come out, there'll be more information on blue carbon. Um, according to your models, when will Maine reach carbon neutrality? Well, that's, that's tough to predict. <laughs> um, as I mentioned, we have a lot of assumptions. We are 91% of the way there, so we are so close, we can almost taste it, right? Unfortunately, our time series, our time series shows that we're there now. And we know that's not true because we know that the time series is not as robust as the carbon budget. So it shows a nice trend, um, but it's not giving us an exact date because those values aren't perfect. Um, so I don't, I don't have a good answer for that. Um, I would just say we need to really keep doing what we're doing. And if we can keep, if we can continue on with the same forest sequestration and reduce those greenhouse gas emissions, we'll be golden, but we'll, we'll leave that up to the climate council to figure out how to get there. Um, how much are the reductions in the industrial sector? How much are they reflective of industry shutting down or leaving the state versus efficiency gains? I have no way of teasing that out. That's a fantastic question though. And we talked about that a lot because obviously we, we do have businesses that have shut down, right? And we've realized greenhouse gas emission reductions as a result. Um, but we also know that our industries are increasing efficiency. They're also switching to lower carbon fuel. So, so they're doing a lot, um, but I don't have a way of teasing that out, unfortunately. Um, the last year you reported is 2021. What are the barriers to more timely reporting? Yeah, so the data lag. So if you remember, I mentioned that we use the state inventory tool and the EIA SEDS data as a foundation. Those data lag by at least two years. So that's kind of a roadblock. We can't do anything until we get those data. And unfortunately, um, this SIT has continued to be delayed a little bit in the last four years. We're hoping that it is released a little earlier going forward and it's slowly creeping back, which is fantastic. Um, so we try to release these results as soon as they are available to us. We crunch those numbers and get those data out to you. Um, how are biofuels accounted for in the transportation sector? Are deforestation and processes, processing emissions incorporated into these calculations? Um, so we count emissions 
that are produced in Maine, right? And so if those biofuels are generated in Maine, then we would count all associated emissions. If those fuels are generated outside of the state, then those emissions are being calculated in another state and not in Maine. Um, so we do account for both biodiesel and fuel ethanol, not just in the transportation sector, but in all sectors. And I think that's it for the Q&A. Great, thank you so much, Stacey. And thanks everyone for joining us this afternoon. Um, as I mentioned in the chat, we'll post these slides online and you can also find the emissions inventory online. Um, so with that, we will wrap it up. Thank you so much. And please reach out to Stacey if you have additional questions. Thanks, Molly. Thank you. Have a wonderful afternoon, everyone.